When Love Speaks. It's a series I've been thinking about doing for quite a few years leading up to Easter. It's based on the seven statements that Jesus makes from the cross. Statements that have had a powerful impact. And you think about it, Jesus is having trouble even breathing from the cross. So to, to, to push himself up enough to, to get these words out, they must have been really important words. And, and certainly when we think of uh, the, the last statements of Jesus, the, these were powerful lessons that have reverberated throughout history. You know, we think of the, the famous saying, you know, famous last words. There are a number of people that have been quoted uh, for example, Terry Kath, he's a Chicago guitarist who uh, died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. But his famous last words were, oh, don't worry, it's not loaded, see? Or, or P.T. Barnum, the circus entrepreneur, his last words were, so what were the uh, receipts today? I mean, the last thing on his mind was how much money he made. But it does show value, right? What, what does a person value? And, and so we think that about Jesus on the cross and say, what were the most important things? What were the things that v he saw a value that he spoke into in those last words on the cross? So I want to set it up by going to Luke chapter 23, and we'll begin in verse 27. It says, a large number of people followed him. That's an interesting statement. Let me just stop right there. A large number of people were following Jesus. Jesus has just left the, a, a trial that was a, really a mockery. Uh, he'd been beaten, he'd been flogged, he'd been whipped, uh, and, and he was he carried across down this road uh, towards the site where he would be crucified. Uh, Simon of Cyrene was recruited from the crowd to help him carry the cross because he was so weak at this point. So as Jesus is stumbling down the road, very little strength left. Luke makes this note, a large number of people followed him. One of the things we could say about that is that why Luke would, would say this is he wanted people to know that this was a well-corroborated story. That this wasn't some secret in the middle of nowhere, that many people saw what was happening. It was also a, a statement about his humility and his humiliation. It was humbling to have a large crowd of people watching him be led out half naked and crucified on the cross. A statement of humiliation. So going back to the verse, a large number of people followed him, it says, including women. Well, of course, <laughs> that, that seems like, why would he point out the women? Well, you're going to see in a moment, he speaks to those women. He says, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Verse 28, Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. I mean, can you imagine the state Jesus is in and he's worried about them? He's still not thinking about himself and all he's going through. That shows a powerful amount of concern and care for others. Love really of another kind. It's interesting, this is the third time Jesus speaks to the women and almost highlights them, giving them a sense of dignity. Uh, and, and it was true that that was the way Jesus lived his life. No woman was ever uh, showed any hostility towards Jesus because Jesus spoke to them with great care and concern. Another thing, uh, this is the sixth warning I noticed towards the city of Jerusalem. He warns the city of Jerusalem that things are going to get bad. And, and, and he says to these women, as bad as, as I look and as bad as I feel, weep for yourselves. He goes on to say in verse 29, he says, uh, For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women and the wombs that never bore and their breasts that never nursed. Why? Because nothing is worse than losing a child. He says in verse 30, Then... They will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. They say, they just want to end this life. It's just too difficult. 
You know, this, this reference is a quote from the book of Hosea. It's also quoted in the book of uh, Revelation. And it speaks of the tribulation period, a time is coming that will be a very difficult time. It also says, but I, I think Jesus is also referring to what will happen in a few years, not only the great tribulation yet to come, but Jerusalem itself would undergo a very difficult time in AD 70 when Titus would come in and destroy and burn and kill the people of the city. It was a difficult time. And Jesus was foreseeing that. And as bad a shape as he was in, he said, you need to weep for yourselves. Things are going to get tough. And he goes on then, verse, the next verse 31, to say, if, for if people do these things when the tree is green, you know, when times are good, what will happen when it's dry, when times are rough? Imagine the injustice. You think people are treating me unjustly? Think about the injustice that will go on when people are going through difficult, hard times, the greed and the selfishness that will rise to the surface. He then moves on from that, and, and we're told that two other men, this is verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. Two other men. This is an interesting stylistic thing that Luke likes to do. He likes to introduce someone, and then they'll come up later in his story and play a significant role. And this is his way of introducing that. He does this with Barnabas and Saul later in Acts. It's just a stylistic thing of Luke. There are two criminals, he said, who were led out with Jesus to be executed. Verse 33, and when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. The place called the skull. This is a, uh, the Greek word there is cranium. Uh, and, and there's an ominous feel to that. It's because there was a rock in the location that looked like a skull. And that was the place they did the crucifixions. It was a dark place that created fear just from its name. The uh, um, Aramaic name was Golgotha, which means also skull. That's where they crucified Jesus. They drove the nails in his hands. No mention of the nails in Luke. What Luke notes, though, he says he was crucified there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left, implying Jesus is in the center. And truly, that was, he is the center of focus and the center of attention in this story, the centrality of Christ. Verse 34, Jesus speaks, and here's the first statement he makes from the cross after he's crucified. And the first statement is this. Father, forgive. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And it says they divided up his clothes by casting lots. I mean, the contrast is so stark. It's, it stands out like he, Jesus has received hate and rejection and mockery and beating and flogging and gambling and, and, and all of this, this anger focused towards him. And his response is to pray with them, for, or pray for them, with a heart filled with love. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It says in verse 35 that the people stood watching. That's quite an indictment on the people, right? They stood there. They did nothing in light of the injustice. The people stood watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. If. They didn't really believe it. They're mocking him. They're sneering at him. Let him save himself. The soldiers also jumped in. They, uh, they also came up and mocked him and, and offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And Jesus' response to this mocking, this, this anger, this hatred, was to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, this is a, a love of another kind. This, this is taking love to another whole level. Let me speak 
on this area of forgiveness, this idea of guilt and dealing with our guilt. Because see, guilt is, is what we feel and forgiveness is what we need. And forgiveness is what we need to sometimes give. I read an interesting article from a guy named Wilfred McClay. He's a columnist in the New York Times. And his, his article was called, The Strange Persistence of Guilt. The strange persistence. Another, what he was talking about was in our society, studies have shown that guilt is on the rise. It, it, it's it's, going, it's go, getting worse in people's lives. And he thinks this is strange. At least his, in his thinking it's strange because he sees religion going downhill. And if religion's going down, then why is guilt going up? Now, he's trying to... He, as one comedian said, you know, guilt and religion, you know... Same thing, different holidays. Well, not in Christianity's case. Because in Christianity, we find the formula for redemption. We find the formula for forgiveness. And so it makes complete sense that if guilt is on the rise, then if Christianity is going down, that guilt would get worse. It makes sense because Christianity isn't causing it. And Christianity is giving. Because of the cross, it gives us that formula to deal with guilt. So let's look at, look at it a little bit. Um, first of all, what, what we usually do with guilt. What, what do we usually do with guilt? Well, we bury it, we blame others, or we beat our, ourselves up. Isn't that true? We bury it, we blame others, or we beat ourselves up. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, he, he played a trick on people, um, some comrades years ago. He, he sent out this anonymous letter to 15 people, and, and it just said, flee at once, all is found out. A- and the, it's, I guess 10 of the people, 10 of his associates fled the country. They didn't know what it was about, but because of the guilt in their lives, it was like, oh, if I ever got found out, I couldn't deal with it. I got to flee. I got to run. How many people are dealing with guilt, carrying that burden? So the first thing we do is we bury it. We bury it. It says in Psalm 32, David, David um, says that it is eating him up from the inside. It, it, it's, it's, it's like uh, toxic waste in his system. You know, when we minimize, we rationalize, and we compromise, all we're doing is, is, uh, uh, is pretending it's not there, but it is. The second thing we always do, often do is we blame others. In Genesis 3, Adam blames Eve, right? And, and it turns out blaming God. It's just he doesn't want to accept that himself. But we make our own choices, right? And the third thing we often do is we beat ourselves up about it. Right? We beat ourselves up. David says in Psalm uh, 38, he talks about um, that, that it's, it, it's eating him up and, and, and it's just hurting him um, from the inside. And, and, it, and it's true, you know, when we... When we, we talk about what we eat, if we want to be healthy, we ought to eat the right things. But, but the other half of health is what's eating us. And if guilt is eating away at us, uh, it's going to destroy us. Uh, one doctor was suggesting that 50% of the people who end up in the hospital could have avoided it if they had just dealt properly with guilt and forgiveness. It just leads to all kinds of problems. So that's what we usually do with guilt. But, well, what does Jesus want us to do with guilt? What does Jesus want to do? He, he wants us to admit it, first of all. He wants us to accept responsibility, and He wants us to ask for forgiveness. He wants us to admit it, a- accept responsibility, ask for forgiveness. It says in Lamentations chapter 3, it says, um, Let us examine ourselves, let us test ourselves, and return to the Lord. Uh, he realizes that we need, to, we need to, to admit it. You know, denying it, it doesn't help. We defeat ourselves when we deceive ourselves. It doesn't help. So we need to admit it. And secondly, we need to a- a- accept responsibility. 
David says in, in Psalm 51, I know my transgressions. Um, you know, we're only as sick as our, our sin, right? Our, we're only as sick as our secrets. And those things that, that we hide are the things that hurt us. It doesn't matter what we've done. It, it only matters what Christ has done for us. And that's why we have to ask forgiveness, which is the third one, right? We have to ask forgiveness. It says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, I mean, we just need to come and ask Him for forgiveness. And He's there to offer forgiveness. We admit it. We accept the responsibility. We ask for forgiveness. So, so then, how does Jesus forgive us? One other thing just about forgiveness. How does Jesus then forgive us? And, and four things. He forgives instantly. He forgives completely. He forgives repeatedly. And He forgives freely. <clears throat> he forgives instantly. There is zero delay. Zero delay. A Christian should not spend more than, than 10 seconds with guilt in their life. If, if we would just learn this pattern of, of admitting it and, uh, and asking for forgiveness, Jesus forgives instantly. Second, he forgives completely. Which sin did Jesus die for? Which, which sins? Well, and the answer is all of them, right? Jesus was nailed to the cross, so you don't have to keep nailing yourself to the cross. He forgave you completely. He forgives repeatedly. Remember Peter coming up to Jesus and saying, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? Thinking he was being really generous. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. You just keep on going. He forgives repeatedly. And finally, he forgives freely. Our greatest need was his greatest gift. He offered Himself at the cross. That's why He went to the cross, to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. His greatest gift was giving Himself for us. So the bottom line, when love speaks, when love speaks, the Father, when, he, when, when Jesus said those, those words, Father, forgive, healing happens. When love speaks, Father forgive, then healing happens. Relationships are healed. People are reconciled. We're reconciled to God. It all becomes possible when we offer forgiveness, when we accept forgiveness. Healing happens. We're given a, a new slate, we're forgiven. You remember the old Etzer sketch game? Came out way back in the 1960s. It was considered one of the top games of the last century. Uh, kids, kids games. <clears throat> and, and basically what it was was a little pad. I think they were red. Mine was red. <laughs> and you turned the knobs and we created designs. But the amazing thing about it is, is when you were done, you could flip it up and the aluminum dust would, would settle in. Any mistakes, your old picture, whatever you drew could be immediately erased. And you were left with a clean slate. That's what happens at the cross. When Jesus comes and offers forgiveness. And he offers it to each one of us. And when we accept that, healing can take place. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time that we have together. I thank you for your word that speaks so powerfully. And thank you for these words of Jesus that are so utterly amazing and profound. God, we thank you that you have offered forgiveness to us. Lord, if there is someone who has not accepted that, that this morning they would respond to the good news that their sin can be forgiven. And that they would say yes to you to following you and to being forgiven. But Lord, it's also a good model, this, this prayer of Jesus from the cross, that we need to offer forgiveness to others. Yes, we've been hurt, we've been put down, and there have been things that happened that aren't fair, 
But that's exactly what happened to Jesus, and he responded with forgiveness. I know it's, it just seems so out of this world. God, help us. Help us to respond in the way you would want us, in the way Jesus responded, with words of forgiveness, first words out of Jesus' lips from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.